Today, I'm speaking with Kristen Whitaker-Hood. Kristen, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we've been friends for a couple of years, and we were trying to do an interview a while ago, and it just didn't work out for some technology issues, but so glad we finally got around to doing it today. I've been really looking forward to hearing your story, and I don't know too much about Kristen in, in, in the big picture. We're going to learn a lot more about her story today, but in terms of a bio, uh, she lives in Maryland. Uh, she has two kids, uh, two teenagers. She is an amateur scholar uh, who just loves to learn. And, and on that note, I'll mention that she runs the Facebook pages Awake in Our Mythology and Heresium, which I'll have the links for beneath our video. Uh, awesome stuff. Amazing work you're doing there. Just helping everybody to find great information quickly. And she has a bachelor's degree with a double major in writing and religious art from Messiah College. She studied religious artwork as well at Temple University and Shepherd University. And she grew up as a Christian in the Assemblies of God denomination. So before we get into the, the details of your, your story, um, could you tell us just some fun things about yourself? Oh, I don't know. My favorite things are just being a, a mom uh, to my two kids. I um, I was good friends with, um, if, I don't know if you've read uh, Dia Murdoch, The Christ Conspiracy. Mm -hmm. um, I got to know her before she passed. That was one of the things. We were pretty good mom friends. I think her son is about the same age as my daughter. Do you have a quick plug um, for that? Yes. And that is on an excellent book. Actually, um, the reworking, the revised, edited one with Robert Price is fantastic. It's much tighter than the original version. Mm. Um, actually, if you look through the end, um, N.W. Barker, her, um, her um, partner there, he let me contribute a little tribute letter in the back so when you get to the back of it you might find me in there um awesome. so yeah she was and she was one of the first people that sort of her work uh got me looking into a reinterpretation of how the gospels um well you know how we're told the bible is sort of put together from sunday school um the uh unlocking of the gospel glasses as earl doherty would say taking off your gospel glasses and not reading paul through them uh, so that's, that's one of the things I really, uh, am trying to get people to do. Uh, so mm. that's, that's a real Earl Doherty mission there, but, uh, well, she was one of the first him, people we'll, to do that. We'll yes. give us a plug for his book too. Uh, this is Excellent. one of the couple. The yeah. Jesus Fantastic puzzle. book. Yeah. That's mm. the book that got Richard Carrier to, uh, rethink his, uh, his, historicity of Jesus actually. So, and well, just, to get him to do that going. is no, yeah, no small <laughs> <laughs> I've got him off. Um, yes, and that is the first uh, on the historicity of Jesus, the first peer-reviewed mythicist book. The second one is a uh, really expensive one from Raphael Latastro, which is questioning the historicity of Jesus. But um, he and Richard Carrier actually did a book um, called Jesus Did Not Exist, a debate among atheists. I think he's pulled that back because he wanted to go and do the monograph and stuff. But um that was a great book. And there's actually an interview I posted on Heresy and uh, Awaken Our Mythology with both of them uh, That when they first came out with that book, which is really excellent. So mm. the point is to get a few more biblical scholars and actually lay people uh, looking into a uh, different interpretation than we've had historically from what the church has given us uh, on the available evidence, which is pretty scant actually which is another strange thing so yeah speaking of light um, people let me get one final book uh book, book uh recommendation uh david fitzgerald nailed and the other books that uh, relate to it great great work by uh so many guys and i just want to say go back and say too i'm so glad that you were involved with uh dm murdoch acharya um her work was very profoundly impactful for my life um and i in some ways i still need to go back to it to kind of dig through a lot of the details, but um, I'm hoping to bring some of her stuff back to the forefront and some of the discussions that I have on my channel. And so I'm so glad to hear that you were involved with her life so, so intricately. Yeah, I was really fortunate. We just sort of became more just friends, just discussing stuff, just uh, only probably a year or two before she passed. And that was really, I really missed her for, I mean, I still miss her, but it was just, uh, kind of this, a lot of the same stuff I do with Richard Carey. You just throw things and you're like, what's this? And they're already a hundred steps ahead of you. They've been there. They figured it all out. But uh, she actually passed around the same time my grandmother did. It was literally uh, like five days apart. So Mythicist Milwaukee that Sean and um, and uh, Fritz, uh, they did. They had a great channel and they did a tribute to her. And I would have loved to have been on that, but I was traveling back from Virginia for my grandmother's funeral. But um, that was hard. It was like I got 
spend sort of uh, mourning my grandmother. And then I still kind of got hit with all that with her. And I, I, she was just fantastic. I, I, I hope more people will look into her work. And I really appreciate uh, Robert Price for revising and editing the new version because it's just, it's great. It's, um, it's just really, uh, the first book was excellent, but this book he did, it's just a lot more tightly argued and a um, little more streamlined. And I think she would be happy with it. So hmm. that makes me happy. Yeah. <laughs> well, know, I'll make sure would... I have the links for, for yeah. those people want to check them out on Amazon beneath our video. And yes. uh, Thank in you. terms of your story, we we obviously, I love that background, love just kind of knowing more about where you're coming from, but we also would love to hear the bigger picture of, of your personal life. Um, so I wanted to ask if you could to tell us kind of how you grew up, what was, what shaped your worldview and, and how did that all evolve over the years? Great. So um, my dad's grandmother, she went to a revival meeting in the 20s, back when the whole uh, you know, revival was going on, Billy Sunday, all of those things, and uh, switched their family out from the Methodist Church to the Assemblies of God Church, which to this day, I'm like, oh, I could have been raised in like a, a little more calmer religion. <laughs> I, so that goes back. I Actually, it's probably one of those things. I always loved, I was a little bit jealous of my friends that were like Catholic or Episcopalian and, uh, or you down in Methodist even. They just had a more as an artist, a more visually interesting um, environment to grow up in. So if any of my Catholic friends were getting married or anything, I would be just fascinated with the Stations of the Cross and all the artwork in the churches and stuff like that. Because when you grow up in the Assemblies of God, it's basically just uh, in like a tabernacle format. You know, your basic, very basic church, uh, very iconoclastic. There's not a lot to look at. So... Um, Anyway, yeah, so I grew up in the Assemblies of God Church. My mother also was from that denomination. My my parents met at church camp at Falling Waters, West Virginia, originally. Um, they got married in 1971. I was born in 1972. And then my, my brother and sister followed shortly after. But we had this perfect little, you know, church. We would You spent a lot of time in church when I was growing up. And I was in the middle of I was born in 72. So I grew up in the eighties in the middle of the satanic panic and, you know, the late great planet earth, Hal Lindsey's late great planet earth. And I went to a Christian school from kindergarten through eighth grade. So we had an NIV Bible. We had Bible class. That was one of our textbooks. Um, so I grew up in the, really the middle of uh, even the height of evangelical Christian culture in the assemblies of God. Um, so Basically, since I didn't have this moment, you were constantly having like give your heart to Christ and, you know, always doing that and altar calls and and all of those things um, going to church camp. And, you know, you would have to rededicate your life to Christ. It was, you know, very similar to that movie Saved. <laughs> you, you know, the culture and I backslid last summer and I need to, you know, rededicate my life to Christ. I, you know, that was so much of the culture growing up. Um did you so, feel like I don't I don't know their theology too deeply, but did you feel like you were fairly secure in your salvation in that denomination? I, I did, but you're always trying to be there's so much guilt and you're always I remember being little and thinking, I don't think I've sinned today. I think I've gone through the whole day without sinning. So there's this whole, you know, evaluating yourself at constantly. Um hmm. and thinking, did I get I think today I was good. I think I didn't sin at all today. <laughs> I remember being very small and thinking that, um, you know, to you, that's like not punching your little brother in the face or something or that type of thing. <laughs> but I was like, I was good to him today. I didn't sin today. Um, but anyway, yes, on that so, note, is, it, is it correct that they would have preached a literal hell though, that if you did end oh, up yes. either not being saved or you fell away that you could, you'd, you'd really oh, burn? Yes. yes, they have a, it's a very, you know, fire and brimstone I think they've softened a little bit on things. But when I went to the church, you had to dress up. We got up at 730. We were there. Um, what did they start? 830, 9 o'clock until at least noon. You might go out to dinner. You went back on Sunday evening for a couple hours. Mm -hmm. And you went Wednesdays also. And then you had, I had youth group on Fridays. And then Bible quizzing. We did Bible quizzing. So we memorized we went to championships, you know, this was back, this was when I was in middle school, but we were the, yes, we were the Assemblies of God um, award-winning championships of like 1984. 
Mm-hmm. We, you learn to memorize a lot of the Bible, which does come in handy later on. Um, you don't learn to, it's it's interesting to have all this up in your head and then have somebody like Richard Carrier, Carrier or David Fitzgerald come around and they sort of flip all of the interpretation of all that stuff that you have in your head. Um, but it's handy to have it because all these verses come back to you and you're like, oh, wait a minute. I've got this. And this might have been what they meant by this verse and not the way I was brought up, you know, to, well, anybody that's gone to church knows the tradition. You're taught taught to um, that the gospel of Jesus was like in about the 30s. Paul came in about the 50s. Acts and the gospels are historical, basically, you know. So when people come around and they they make you rethink that, um, it's interesting to have all those verses still up in your head and then to be able to reinterpret them in that light. And they can make a lot more sense that way. There's a lot of things that you're sort of taught to just gloss over, you know, don't ask yeah. too many questions, you know? So um, mm. anyway, so we, yeah, I spent a lot of time, uh, like I said, also on top of all the hours in church, I was going to a Christian school as well. So uh, there was, um, there was a lot of uh, Christian education involved. Um, I did go to a public high school and then uh, first year, my first year of college, that's when I was at Shepherd. That's when my parents split up, which was really hard. I kind of felt like mm-hmm. I'd had like the leave it to beaver lifestyle until then. Um, and I think that was part of what drove me to transfer back to our Christian school because it was sort of my little safe place to deal with all of those things. <laughs> so mm-hmm. um, I, I transferred to Messiah my sophomore year, which was. Um, yeah, you talk about purity culture. We weren't allowed to dance at Messiah until my last year that they took that out of the community covenant. But, um, yeah, so that was the first song, the first dance they had, the first song was Footloose. So, yeah. <laughs> that was the amazing. first party. Yeah, it was interesting. I, it was the whole thing. <laughs> I went to Lancaster Bible College. I mean, I went to mm-hmm. Bob Jones University for, for my freshman year, but then I went to Lancaster Bible College for the rest of my bachelor's degree. And it was very similar. Like you couldn't go to the movie theater and play cards. And by the time I was done, it was like it had changed. I was like, why this big shift? But yeah, it was, it was weird how things that were so wrong and inappropriate and very much showed you as like not a serious Christian were suddenly not a big deal and and definitely makes you, makes you think twice about it all. But um, can I ask with, you mentioned purity culture, what exactly does that mean? uh, What did it mean to you when you, when you were growing up in that? Well, yeah, it was, and that was, it was an interesting thing to grow up in a Christian school because a lot of people just sort of circumvented, you know, all of that, but it was, uh, you know, and I think that was part of probably something with my parents getting too young. I don't know. I haven't asked them too much about it, but they were very young when they got married. They were mm. like 20 and 21. Uh, you know, for me, that's young. I didn't get married till I was 25. I didn't have kids till I was 30. Um, but I think that whole thing of, you know, no sex till marriage and a very, you know, you have to be very proper, have be very proper in your relationships. Um, I think I know at Messiah, a lot of that wasn't going on, but they were trying to uphold that, Um, you know, at at least externally they were. Um, Mm. So there was a lot of, you know, uh, you go out with your friends and you hear all the stories and everybody knows. And, but it, I think even with relationships that I had there, it was a struggle. I think sometimes because, you know, you're 20 and you're, you're in the middle of all this stuff and it's literally like, calm down. We've got it. You know, you've got different people that are coming from these same uh, backgrounds and it, it sort of can warp you a little bit in terms of your able being able to be intimate with people because you sort of have these little hangups and you're in a group with people that still have these hangups that they've come from the same culture. So I think I saw that a lot. And another thing I will say, um, I wish I had been more aware of, and I wish I'd been raised to better understand the LGBTQ community um, because there was an underground one at Messiah. I didn't know a whole lot about it um, till later, till we had uh, uh, some like alumni Facebook meetings and sort of thing like that. And um, I had a friend actually that had committed suicide or tried to commit suicide. I'm sorry, did not commit suicide, but tried to like literally was put in the hospital. 
um, over it. I didn't understand. They are now transgender. I didn't understand all of the issues there. Um, and I don't know if I could help them, but I think I was to this day feel like I could have been a better friend to them. Um, but they were in a bad situation and a bad culture, which was not uh, a healthy environment or didn't teach them healthy ways to deal with what they needed to deal with. And now they're, they're much happier person. And I'm, I'm glad to still be friends with them. Um, but I've, I remember that going, uh, going to the hospital to visit somebody. I mean, so it wasn't like some dramatic thing. It was, uh, it was a legitimate suicide attempt. Um, and mm. that was not understanding why are you here? What there's, you know, what's going on. And later on, I found out, you know, a lot of it had to do with being transgender. Um, and I always felt bad about that. I always felt like I should have been a better friend. I should have been more understanding of maybe, or you're, you're taught to be sort of judgmental and you're taught to, you did not taught very much about how to deal with that sort of thing. So I see churches such as like uh, the Presbyterian church and uh, the United Methodist church who are at least segments of them. It's tearing them apart right now. They're really kind of splitting up over it, but at least there's a place for people to go to be safe if they do want to, still participate in church um they're not being told that they're going to hell for you know for who they are or for who they love and i i'm glad that there are at least segments of the christian community um kathy baldock is a christian who works with the um that community and and with churches matthew vines is another one um uh in order to help churches to be a little more understanding and open and less harmful to that community. So I guess I'm saying like from that time, those are things that I regret. I wish I'd been a, I wish it's, you want to, sometimes you look back and you think in being, trying to be a better Christian, I don't think I was a better person. I'm a better person now um, for giving that up. And I think I do more. A lot of times, how many times have we said, you know, I'm praying for you and this and that. You don't have that prop anymore. Once you decide you're going to leave that, um, you don't have the Christianese anymore to as a crutch to lean on. And I do tell people, you know, I, I'm thinking of you and I, you know, I wish you the best. But the other thing is, is I notice now I try to do more. I, I, instead of just saying, I'm praying for you, I actually do feel like I put more effort into trying to uh, do more for people when they need something. So anyway, that's mm -hmm. sort of some of the things I feel like I've, I've left behind some of my regrets from being raised in Christian culture. Uh, it's all turned out well for me, but um, you look back and I think anybody you, well, you're, you've interviewed so many people that have left and they have, I'm sure their regrets from being raised in the culture. And actually I still have friends from a style that was sort of like atheist, agnostic. A lot of them are still Christians, but I have a group of actually one of them is my transgender friend. Um, they, we talk about sort of like, you know, I'm sorry I was this way. I'm sorry I was that way. I, you know, I had a lot of growing up to do. Um, so that's I, that's sort of where I'm coming from. I've had a lot of time to discuss with some of my friends who have left Christianity uh, and sort of work through it themselves and thinking, yeah, I was such a jerk, you know? <laughs> but you thought you're a great Christian, you know, at the time because you were following the rules. But you look back and you're like, I might have been a good Christian, but I don't think I was a good person. Uh, you know, I don't think I was a good friend to you. And that was more important, you know, in the scheme of things. It's interesting that you share that because it reminds me of the the concept that I think a lot of uh, my interviewees have said, and I, I would echo it as well, that there is this sense in which whether, even if we don't necessarily feel there was something we regret, although there's a lot of things I, I certainly do and people that I interview do, but even if you don't regret certain things, there's still this sense of you were mentally judging people all the time. And it was like a very constant dichotomy of, like if I walked into a room I would be sent, trying to sense the vibe of seeing who who is a Christian and also yes. maybe who is a truly um, on fire Christian versus who is not a Christian <laughs> and who is a casual Christian. And mm -hmm. like you're, you're, you felt like your goal was to either preach the gospel to someone to get them saved 
or to kind of re-preach the implications of the gospel to the Christians to say, do you realize you got saved from sin? So why are you acting like the world now? And the the whole um, LGBTQ plus stuff, it was, it's interesting. I felt like that was in my circles that I grew up in. It was kind of like I was oblivious to it. Like mm-hmm. it wasn't like people were necessarily uh, attacking those groups in the, in the churches I was in. Although my, my dad had this, this like, tendency to to occasionally go to a really conservative fundamentalist baptist church and he would go like for a few weeks and then he'd co- you know come back to the churches that we would go to as a family and i could sense that he was like thinking they're being more faithful to the word by preaching the hard hard verses which do condemn homosexuality things like that but he, you know he was tempted to to try to move his theology in that more uh, harsh direction but even in the more liberal you know say quote unquote quote unquote liberal uh, churches that I was involved in at different times, it was like we just ignored it all. It wasn't even like we were attacking per se, but we ignored it, which does leave the, the reality of what you're saying. And people kind of had to just kind of go underground and find, you know, a few quiet friends here there they could trust. But then you realize, like, even if I wasn't attacking them all this time, I was still ignoring an incredible amounts of pain and emptiness and loneliness that they were dealing with, okay. no doubt. And and I was at the same point judging them for their salvation or, or lack thereof. And you real you do realize, um, like you're saying, you, you you have a lot to to apologize for, basically, if you can. And I've actually gone back to some people that I could find, um, pe- you know, kids in youth group that are now adults, and apologize for for being involved in this, you know, in Christianity and, and teaching them. Most of them, you know, it's like it's not worth doing it because they either they already left and like I don't care, it's it's all past under the water under the bridge. Water or they're still bridge. Christians and they're like, what are you talking about? Christianity is real, so don't apologize for it. You need to get saved now. But um, it is weird to think through it all. And uh, I know I've, I've I've shared before I've preached a lot of in a lot of soup kitchens over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, endless um, preaching on the streets in Philadelphia and soup kitchens in Chester, outside of Philadelphia, and it just yeah. hundreds of people that I did yeah. that for. And I think I I could have gotten some of those people saved. And, and, you know, I, I kind of got so many people on the wrong path and I, I regret that deeply. It definitely eats at you to realize yeah. the damage you could have done. Yeah. I've, you're talking about Philadelphia and preaching. I did, um, I served a summer at, uh, Tony Campola's EAPE. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's his son, Bart has gone on now. He did, Bart had kingdom work, but, uh, he's gone on now to become a atheist humanist, uh, humanist pastor did, uh, that's right. We were talking about that at one point, um, He's, maybe someday he'll be able to you'll be able to get him on um of course he's still got all that great preacher charm to him um really great speakers both of them but uh that's funny because i did i spent i think it was summer of 91 um in passiunk in philadelphia uh we did uh, we did well that you went to church um a lot there it was just actually a great experience we went to the ame church there Um, But we went and we put, basically we did free daycare for the children that in our city community there. Um, Yeah. And me coming off, I lived on a farm in Maryland and I'm walking in the worst part of Philadelphia over, like you're trying to sweep off crack files because people would come out and, you know, do drugs in the community center. They had like a playground at night. So in the morning you're trying to, you know, sweep away all the crack files and stuff. So you could sit down and make a little circle for the kids to do their artwork or whatever, you know? Mm. So they had different little, uh, we've set up little kind of little stands and the kids would move throughout the day. So they would do artwork. They would do, you know, like little lessons, reading lessons and stuff like that. So it was, it was like free daycare for the community, but, um, and I met, you know, wonderful people, actually still some of them I'm Facebook friends with some of them are more into, just like everybody else, they have a different range. They've where people have kind of gone out on the spectrum of their religion over the years. Some people are more into it. Some people are less into it. Um, so I think in that being said, there are um, organizations like that, which I think can be the structure. And I think that's what Bart Campolo is doing, trying to keep some of the positive, positive social structure uh, going without that, uh, the Christian mindset which is I, t- I just feel like it's warped that's all it's sort of the whole um do good for your this is what i liked about it do good for your fellow human being and you don't need uh, the bible to do that or church to do that you can keep that social construct i'm going to do this for you because you need the help and i can do something for you 
you know, and that's, that's the same thing. Like for, you know, you have children, you know how expensive daycare can be. So summertime um, can be really expensive for people that are on a budget. So I think he did a, a really good thing for people, but there were, um, there was a lot of Bible in it. You know, there was a lot of, uh, of that too. So I think if we could take some of those things, the social, uh, her social positive things like that. And there's, you know, a lot of churches that do daycares too. Um, positive. I, I see maybe Christianity, the age of Christianity sort of transitioning into an age of humanism. Uh, so I, I see that being possible where we can just be like, I'm doing this because you're a human being and I'm a human being and I can help in this area, I can do this, not because I want to win you to Jesus. I have an agenda and I'm going to save the world just by being a good person and being kind to other people. Not, I've got to save you to my religion. You've got to convert to my religion. That is not exactly logically sound anyway. (laughs) So when you were um, a Christian, would you have called those kind of Christians Christians? Um, yeah, you know what I think? I think I had a, I had a better, I met people there that I think were less interested in the Bible and more interested in social, a good social structure, um, creating a better wow. world. And I, that changed me a little bit. It was more about making the world better regardless um, and less about trying to to just save everybody. There were people there that were like that. They wanted to preach the gospel. But I, I ended up with a group of people that were more about just, I'm here to do something good, you know? And you can do that. Um, my dad now, he's become a little, you know, he's become a lot less religious as he's gotten older. He's he's just like an old man of the woods. He wants to go walk in the woods all the time. And he he says, do the good. Replace God with good. Just um, do something good for people. Be kind. And it sounds like kind of trite, but it's the truth. You can just be a good person. You don't need Jesus to do this. You don't need a specific doctrine. Um, but that's the thing we always get caught up in. You know, I've talked to Derek uh, Lambert about that too a little bit. You know, you're so, you're correct doctrine. And he was in, um, you know, that real extra hyper Calvinist cult. So he likes to kind of make fun of himself. But I always joke, I'm like, well, you were predestined to do that. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, um, it's interesting that you say that because I, I... I think the groups I've grew up with and and certainly the, the groups that I kind of chose to to listen to more and on the radio or the books and theologians, they would have really attacked that mentality. Um, and I, I would have gone yeah. along with that attack in the sense of saying, like, it doesn't matter if you go into the afterlife as the most upstanding policeman or as a prostitute, if you don't have Christ, you know, it doesn't really matter right. what your life here was like. And, you know, whether you look shiny where you look like your life's falling apart, um, you're rich, you're poor, any any of the spectrums that we could look at, it really doesn't matter. The only thing that matters, like they would say that the, at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, you we all come and we all bow our knee and we all say, I'm a wretched sinner in need of, uh, you know, amazing grace. And so people that would kind of say, well, let's make society better. Let's clean up our cities. Let's give the kids, you know, inner city kids a better chance at an education and food. It would have been like, those are good things, but they're not the main thing. And I guess mm-hmm. I wanted to ask if, if you would agree with what, like, was there a time in which you got presented with this message of, you know, Christian, you can do good things that we would call good as humans, but before God, your righteousness is like a filthy rag. Mm-hmm. Anything you, you do good is actually, if you do it in the flesh, which we all start as, you know, doing in the flesh, right. that. God actually sees that as not a good thing because it's a way of you having a sense of pride of saying, God, look what I did. I chose this good thing. I made this healthy choice. And God wants you to say, if you do anything apart from me, it's bad, period. Therefore, you need to simply empty yourself of all pride, say you're a sinner, and then, of course, turn your eyes on on the cross and the resurrection. Was there a time in which Mm -hmm. you got kind of a strong gospel presentation where you gave your life to Christ? Oh, yeah. Well... I would say we, well, I went to church camp when I was in sixth grade and that was a very, um, you know, they were, I, I never got the whole speaking in tongues thing, but that was, you were encouraged to do that at the the meetings. And 
that was probably in, in middle school was the time when I was the most like, it is about your doctor and it is about everything. God, you got to depend on him for everything. Um, was the tongue seen thing. as like a proof of salvation? Yes. Like it, or, or gift. You have a gift. And there's mm -hmm. people that had the gift of tongues and uh, the people that had a gift of interpretation, which is, of course, nobody knew what the people who were speaking in tongues were saying. It's just that person sitting next to them got to interpret it, which was usually whatever they wanted <laughs> it to say. So um, my people used to tell me my other girl, my mother's mother had that gift, but she was very... Um, she was a take charge person. So it doesn't surprise me that whenever someone was speaking in tongues, she interpreted it. <laughs> she was, she was that kind of person. She ran the church pretty much as, uh, uh, where I grew up. Um, she was one of the head people in charge. So it's, it's funny how, you know, God always says what you want him to, but, uh, yeah, that's very anyway, <laughs> it's hmm. too many stories on that, but yeah, you're right. So getting back to talking about like Tony Campolo and that organization, that was the first time I, I think you look back and it seems like a million steps, little steps that you start taking away from that strict doctor. And then I need God, I'm, you know, I'm a filthy sinner. And you start seeing people that are just good They're And you know that they're, they're there in a religious context, but some of them, you, you know, you get a sense of people and you just feel like these people would be good no matter what. Um, no matter what they, what their doctrine was or their religion was, I feel like these are just people that want to do good. Um, and how do you say, you know, you don't believe as I, your belief system is going to keep you out of heaven. You start to begin to uh, rethink things. And, you know, I mean, Jeffrey Dahmer got baptized and accepted Jesus into his heart before he died. So he's as good as the rest of us, according to Christian doctrine, but you know, he's as equal the foot of the cross, you know, but people are like, that's terrible. But I'm like, that's, you know, yeah. But look at how he lived his life. Look at how other people have lived their lives. You can't put everybody on the same footing. If you spent your life trying to help other people versus trying to, you know, destroy other people, harm other people. And it's not just, you know, I mean, that's an extreme example, but there's people that are, uh, you know, they're selfish in their, in their lives and their work lives or, anything like that is all about me and stepping on other people. And then you have these other people that are giving up their work time, their summer um, income when you're in a college, you know, you're trying to make a few extra bucks, but you're giving up your sub summer income. You're doing this for free. And it, uh, it costs money, of course, to keep living, um, you know, buying food and all that. And you're going to the worst part of the city to try to just do free daycare for children uh, who need it, whose parents are, you know, might be drug addicts and, or just trying to get by. Um, and you're, you don't, I didn't even realize when I was older, what a gift that was uh, to just come in and help somebody with their children for the summer. And mm. so when you have little kids, you're like, wow, somebody just come for free and just take my kids and give them good, you know, education and, and, uh, and a uh, positive uh, social environment for a few hours every day. That's, that's the gift. But did anyway, you, so that, go ahead. I'm see, sorry. With, with your work in Philadelphia, did you get involved at all with open air campaigners at all? Are you familiar with that? I group? didn't. No. They're, they're really cool. They, um, I say they're cool in the, in the context of if you're a Christian, but they, they do these paint boards where like, it's like a really big uh, board with, um, they'll, they'll pre-paint a, a picture, but it looks really weird when you first see it. Cause you're like, ah. I think they're trying to paint something, but it just looks like random, random stuff brushstrokes mm -hmm. and as they're doing their gospel presentation they'll take out and they'll just do like one little stroke here and one little stroke there and all of a sudden it's like it's a mm -hmm. letter and then they'll do it like they'll do this and they're kind of filling in the gaps quickly but you know 90 percent of it's already pre-painted mm -hmm. but as they do these little quick strokes the painting comes together and you see what they've been what, what they kind of hid behind the scenes of the painting but the, the goal was to of course mm -hmm. do a lot of gospel presentations and we would do that endlessly with groups of kids um mm -hmm. But they and of course they love it and it is a really cool thing to to be able to bless families with helping their kids. But at the same time, like it's always at that cost of like the, the biggest mm -hmm. thing here is I need your soul, I need your salvation. You know, I need I need to be able to go back to my church and say twenty kids got saved this week, so please keep sending the money. You know, right, right. No, it's true. That you're sort of just, um, you know, you're converting for profit for the church. It's because because saved people are going to church and they're bringing ties into the church. So 
you know, it's sort of a little bit of an industry there, whether you want to admit it or not. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, everybody did it. I mean, and I went like, even at college, um, I was, did you see the family on Netflix? Did you see, I don't know if you ever saw that. That's a really good Netflix so, no. movie. Um, that and the keepers on Netflix are actually really interesting um, to binge watch if you ever get time. The family is about how the national prayer breakfast is being used to infiltrate uh, basically the government, um, kind of some backdoor mm -hmm. policy issues going on. Um, there were things even at my college, I can't say exactly that happened, but I remember being, there was back rooms, back banquet rooms where important people would come. And I was, uh, I would work there sometimes in the other summers, um, you're serving coffee to these people and things like that. And I, they had this image of all these people I've in that show in the, um, the family. Um, and there was this girl pouring coffee behind all the men. And I was like, I had this flashback. I'm like, I remember being that girl pouring coffee behind important people that were in the back rooms at these Christian evangelical schools. Cause I was, I was in Pennsylvania too. And that's a prominent, prominent school for evangelical hubs. Um, but there's a lot of political things going on as well uh, that we're supposed to be separation of church and state, but there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes. Um, so anyway, that, the, the family is a good uh, investigation into uh, some of those things that are going on with evangelical culture that are uh, affecting our, our lives, our um, secular lives, you know, even things like with the, you know, the whole abortion, all of those things. Um, there's a lot of people going on behind the scenes doing some, some things like that. So that is a, that's a great show to think about and think about who in evangelical culture, especially now with the rise of Christian nationalism, you know, those are some things um, that have been going on for a while, but they just seem to be coming to a, to a head uh, in this country. Uh, so anyway, getting back to that, um, I was thinking about that like, being in college. It sort of reminded me of that, that there's a lot of, a lot of things going on uh, with evangelical culture in particular, which is, you have people that are working about, they're talking about salvation, but they're also trying to get power in the world. Um, so they might justify that as, oh, well, I'm getting more people saved, but uh, you're, you're affecting a lot of people. And sometimes it's like, it's getting to the point where it might be affecting their health, you know, their health rights and that type of thing. So the stuff we're talking about is big. It's, it's got, you know, big implications um another thing i was uh yeah the keepers if anyone ever gets to see that on netflix um i actually found out that was that was actually a priest this was at a catholic school which has um, been torn down recently um keo bishop keo school in in baltimore in the 70s there was a priest running like a, a sex trafficking ring he was sex trafficking the girls um in oh. the school he would try to find people that were abused that sort of had already been groomed or were could be groomed um something was going on with the police department, possibly being sex traffic to the police department in Baltimore. Um, anyway, so I called my dad because my dad grew up in that area. My gra dad graduated in like the six late 60s and this all happened in the late 60s, 70s. Um, and I just had this weird feeling. I was like, dad, you gotta get up. He didn't want to get Netflix. But um, I said, this is like your area. This is when you were in high school and um, he didn't go to that, you know, the high school, he went to a public high school, but so he called me, he's, oh my gosh. Um, I spoke at the retirement dinner of one of the women that were in this video, that were in this show, the documentary. So it's, so he found out one of his coworkers um, had been, you know, involved in this. And so you get a, a, a back story there for somebody that you worked with for years and you didn't know they went through all of this stuff. Um, so mm. these are things that were done um, at a time when the church had a lot more respect and you couldn't question the church, but it's, uh, I always tell people to watch. Those are some really important ones to watch. Actually, one of my, um, one of the Maryland assembly, um, was he a Senator? No, he was a Congress. Um, delegate one of the delegates Marilyn contacted me I used to babysit um many years ago and he's his parents had gotten interviewed for the keepers 
uh, they had cut that part out, but he was like, thank you for sharing this because I've been looking for this. Um, but he, um, you'll, if you watch it, you'll see there's another delegate who had been abused and what has happened is they worked to um, eliminate or at least extend the statute of limitations for people that have been sexually abused for them to come forward. Uh, so mm. there's a lot of things that, awesome. um, yeah, and it, the things the church worked against and is still the Archdiocese of Baltimore is still working against, I I feel like. And I think the people uh, that are involved in the Keepers feel like this, too. Um, they have a Facebook page. Um but anyway, that goes back to another thing where church is not doing things which are actually beneficial to people. Um, and there's also things in government that they're affecting, which are not beneficial to people. So uh, those are some things like, you know, as you leave religion, you can get your brain sort of wrapped around. Like um, when you're a Christian, everything is for the Lord. Everything is for the Lord, or at least supposed to be. You're it's framed that way. Um, as you leave it, you can sort of get outside of the church and say, I don't think that's good. You know, I don't think that's a good thing for for people in general. It's not it's not good to fight to keep a, a limit on statutes of you know, of limitations for people that have been sexually abused. Or um it's not proper to use a national prayer breakfast to go do political dealings and um, even it becomes a, a door for places like Russia or China to kind of come in and, and have some effect on some of the things that are going on. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's the thing to get outside of, of church and what it's sort of what's in your head of, okay, this is the church. Church is good. God is good. This doctrine is good just because they tell me it is. Um, and I think it's, one of the things that's really great about uh, Richard Carrier, he is whatever um, he's talking about, he is advocating for critical thinking, critical thinking. And you know, he wrote the book, Sense and Goodness Without God. I think that's an important book for people who are trying to get outside of religion to read. Um, so I, I'd say he's one of those, he's one of the, he's very important in terms of writing and uh, leaving. He did, Sometimes it's funny because he doesn't have that sense of evangelical culture. He wasn't raised in that. And I'm sort of, you know, I throw something out there and he's like, what? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. But um, he didn't have that sort of, you feel like you're a little bit damaged. Uh, so he he was, he went to church, but it was a much more kind of secular minded church. Um, but Can I ask I, you, you yeah. mentioned the, the abuses that you were talking about there with the archdiocese and so forth. Mm -hmm. What was the abuse issue? What started to get you out of Christianity or, or like, how did you first personally not, you know, not to start to see abuses mm -hmm. and say, we should as a society resolve that and fix that and address it. But mm -hmm. like what first got you to think about whether or not the Christian worldview was actually reality? Yeah. Oh, it's like I said, sometimes I look back and I feel like it was a thousand steps coming out of it. A lot of it, my, my mother said she sent me to a Christian college and I came out an atheist, but I wasn't actually an atheist mm -hmm. when I graduated. I went to, but you know what? I think you learned it too, probably. You see a little bit of how the sausage is made, you know, when you start going in to a, a school and you learn the Bible and hermeneutics and, um, uh, you know, Christian history, you learn all the different theologies that have come along um Calvinism you know all the, you're just so you realize there's a lot of human input into this interpretation that I'm being given there's not one and there's a lot of different versions of Christianity and there were a lot of different versions of Christianity to begin with and um so I I mean I literally probably didn't even consider officially leaving until I was in my probably like 42 or probably about 2013 or so um, I had come across Dan Murdoch's work, just researching, um, I had started actually, it, it did start with, uh, I think a coworker. I was, I probably had a view. I read a lot of Joseph Campbell, a lot of that, uh, stuff. So that sort of primes you for realizing that, okay, there's a lot of these things in here that are similar to other pagan things. And there's a lot of archetypes here that are similar to pagan, you know, all the, you know, a lot, it's everything that's in Greek literature. I'm, I'm going Dennis McDonald on you. You can hold the book up, but there's a lot of themes, right? 
that yes so he's brilliant at pulling out like the greek you know mythology yeah. um parallels in the new testament brilliant brilliant at that yeah. um but it's like the hero's was, journey even the, even the yeah. broader stuff the hero's yes. journey kind of joseph stuff. campbell yes yeah. and a, a lot of it with me began with joseph campbell reading joseph campbell's work um and so basically yeah i i, I started out in a very uh strict hellfire we're in living in the end times kind of thing and i became exposed to different varieties of christians um and like i said people that were more as i remember being in tony campola's organization and being exposed to these people that were it the gospel was important and you if you listen to tony campola you know it's important but what's really important is social um positivity doing something socially positive so you become exposed to a different group of Christians who are more concerned in doing something in this world instead of let this world go to hell, you know, it's the end, who cares? Um, so even though you're within Christianity, the mindset is a little different there. You're, you're trying to do something here and now, and instead of just letting everything, you know, go up with apocalypse. Um, and I think going to Messiah, I met, that's a very Anabaptist school. It's a um, brethren in Christ school. So it's a very humble school. Um, which is very different than if you're raised in like a Baptist school or uh, um, the Assemblies of God. They're very um, low key. You're just the culture is a little more low key, not flashy, um, humble, pious. A little. That's where the Amish and the Mennonites come out of that tradition. So, just that culture, it's a little bit more simple. Uh, so, I'm you're coming in into contact with a lot of different types of Christians um, with a lot of, so that, that can change your beliefs too. So you're becoming less about, you know, the, the assemblies of God interpretation of Pentecostal interpretation of the Bible. You're, you're uh, coming into, I was coming into contact with people that interpret the Bible, same Bible, but in different ways. So that sort of begins to change you. Um, and it, Later on, I um, I was going to like a United Methodist church by the end, by the time I probably left. And I just wanted to go to a, I called it quote unquote normal church when my kids were younger. I'm like, I'm not going to raise them in this crazy environment of people speaking in tongues and this, you know, the, the United Methodist church is pretty, it's not a whole lot of a step different from an Episcopalian church. It's just a little bit more laid back, less kneeling and, you know, uh, that type of thing. Um, it's about the most laid back church you can go to. Uh, but even that, um, I was still like, you're doing the doctrines and the responses and you're still, I'm still, you're still thinking like, eh, I don't know, you know, you, the more you think about it. And then I, I got to this point where I was uh, thinking a lot about uh, the crusades, the inquisitions uh, and, and all the people that have been hurt by Christianity. I just went through this phase where I'd be in church and I'm just thinking like, wow, so many people have died because of this religion. And I'm sitting in here and you sort of just couldn't stop thinking about that. And I'm like, how can that be good? So many people have been tortured and, you know, died, have been killed and then have been um, even just oppressed women, you know, all of that. So I was just going through a phase where I was thinking about that. And then, um, yeah, there around 2013, that's when, uh, Dia Murdoch, her work was becoming a little bit more prominent. People were, it was getting a little more popular. So I um, ended up finding a page which uh, promoted a lot of her work. That's where I ran into Sean and Fritz on Mythos Milwaukee, which was primarily a page just promoting her work at that time. Um, but I'm the kind of person who I got to investigate everything. So I ended up finding around that time was when Richard Carrier's book came out. So I was like, well, there's this guy who's got a PhD and he's got this book coming out. So it started, started bringing in more people into Mythicist Milwaukee. And, and Sean and Fritz, and particularly Sean, is really fantastic at reaching out to people and putting on events. And Brian, um, Brian was great too. They were just really professional. Put on, they started, we went from being like a Facebook page. They, I was just posting some stuff on their page and they um, messaged me and they're like, you want to join? And I'm like, sure. So um, I was just digging up stuff. Um, so it started with DM Murdoch's work. That's how their whole page started. They uh, read her, The Christ Conspiracy. The second version wasn't out yet. 
And then I am just like, I don't know, I'm just kind of like a dog digging up bones all the time. I got to find more stuff, find more stuff. So I started posting more stuff that would, I thought like would support her work. Um, but I found more people. It was like Richard Carrier, David Fitzgerald, um, you know, all that. Can a I lot ask, of them she already knew. Uh-huh. For those of us uh, in the audience who might not know what Dan Murdoch or Acharya was all about, what she was doing, could you just give a quick, you know, a minute sure. or two summary of kind of what she was bringing to the table? What were the main passions of her heart yeah. and her messages? Um, she she had a really broad background, um, really intelligent, bright person. Um, there's like anything I thought I could find. She's like I said, she was already 10 steps ahead, but she had the Christ conspiracy. The original one was just huge. It was, um, she looked into a lot of early Christianities into the, the stellar part of it. Um, like the celestial part, that's more like what Bill Darlis and, you know, he gets into, even the numbers. So there's a lot of people that have broken down into more of a, a specialty. She had a sort of like an umbrella over top of these things. So where Bill Darlison has done like the astro theology, she had already done that. Um, Mike Lawrence, his book 70 is out. I, it's sort of a rewriting of a couple of his pri uh, prior books, which was like Contra Ehrman. Um, He's really good with the numbers, the significant numbers. Uh, she had gotten to that too, like the significance of the year 70, possibly, um, th that type of thing. He, uh, he's, he's really well worth reading. Um, Paul George is another one who does post 70. I, um, I say his stuff's worth reading. Um, he is argues for everything post 70 Christianity, like everything happened after the Jewish wars, including his a late dating for Paul and stuff. But I say his worth, he's really good at doing the cargo cult, um, how Christianity could have evolved out of it, like a cargo cult type of situation. He gives some really good examples on that. So mm -hmm. I'm the type of person who might say like, okay, I don't think I'm going to go with like nine of these things, but that 10th thing is very usable. Yeah. Which drives people like Richard Carrier crazy. Cause he's like, you know, but um, that's how I see it. So I'm like, I, I, I feel like the Doty thesis, which is what Richard Carrier has kind of taken and gotten through peer review. And Raphael Latastor has gotten through peer review is the strongest theory. But I think sometimes other people have things that they can contribute. Anyway, getting back to that, Dean Murdoch, she's sort of an umbrella for all of these things that people seem to have pulled out and specialized in. Um, really good at talking about all the different early sects of Christianity. So she's she's a good intro uh, into, I don't even want to call it mythicism. I just call it questioning the model that we have, um, mm. that the church has provided us with for Christianity. I don't insist that people believe that, quote unquote, Jesus never existed. Um, it's more about there's another model for Paul perhaps having an angel, which is not all that, un, you know, all that different from what say like the Jehovah's Witness or the the um, Mormons. The yeah, the Mormons or the um, I'm going to say the Seventh Day Adventists, not the Latter Day Saints, but the Seventh Day Adventists. They have a, a celestial pre-existing. They just do think Jesus came to Earth, but if you just say he was crucified in the heavens in a Gnostic manner, people that understand Gnosticism may understand that concept a little bit better. So I always tell people, look, read about the Gnostics. Um, I tend to think that uh, there, there's something a little more, not it's, it's a general term Gnosticism. It's not like a very um, strict term, but the people that have those more platonic ideals, um, that was, that was a big thing in that time period. So it's always probable. And I, I think that there were people that were worked into the gospels, like, um, like Jesus, Ben Anias, uh, those type of things. Uh, people were like, whoa, unto Jerusalem. Like after the seventies, you could take people that were those tropes. There was a lot of people that were crucified. There were a lot of people that were, you know, um, messiahs and work that into the gospels. But Paul's, Paul's Jesus may have been something apart, something more of a, a god of a mystery cult or an angel or the logos or you know something celestial yeah and you it can seems like i with, think they make a good argument for that um seems like in so many of those topics there's like when people try to look at the origins of christianity one of the biggest issues that i see is they're they're, they're just taking a small slice of it and it mm -hmm. seems like in almost every discussion i see about it i'm like well that's interesting but like whatever they just said 
that's really fascinating stuff, but there's just so much more to be said. And mm-hmm. um, it, it, one, like, for example, I, I see almost nobody talking about Enoch. And mm-hmm. I'm like, right. how can you talk about the origins of Christianity and leave Enoch almost unsaid? I mean, it's it mm-hmm. comes up from the discussions I hear, like maybe one or two percent of the time, like Enoch was so foundational to the origins of Christianity and they barely ever bring it up. And, you know, again, going back to Dan Murdoch with astrotheology, like these people they clearly wove it into the scriptures. Um, you know, you talk about Jesus saying, find uh, the man where the, the man carrying a water pitcher will help you to find the upper room. I mean, they right. knew right. Th- this stuff was woven all throughout it. And it just, it go- the list of, of examples, it just goes on and on to the point where you can't really ignore it anymore. It's in so right. many of these passages and on top of the, uh, you know, mimesis from the Old Testament, as well as the Greek epics. But you look at all this stuff and you just think there's so much more. And when you add it all up, it's kind of like everyone keeps, the, at least in the circles I grow, uh, go in, they keep saying, if there was a guy, he's so mythologized, we've kind of lost him to history. Mm-hmm. But at that point, it's like, well, if if he's so heavily mythologized, is mm-hmm. is the it doesn't really matter if we find a guy because that guy is not the guy they're describing. So even right. if you're like, well, he had in mind this guy. Yeah, but that's that's not the guy they ever described. They don't ever tell you who the real guy was. So right. like, it's it's still different anyway. So yeah. it, it, yeah, mythicism to me has has is so compelling. Um, and it, there's some questions I have on it, obviously, but um, it's 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 interesting. Right. Do you do you feel like this is the devil's advocate side? Of course, I think whenever we bring up Dia Murdoch, we have to go here. Do you feel like she took anything too far? And I know that she was heavily involved with the script for the Zeitgeist movie, mm-hmm. um, the the first part of it. Do you feel like she took some things too far? Like, how do you how do you interpret her part in all that? Um, I think with the Zeitgeist Heist movie, um, one of the criti- criticisms of it was that it was, you know, Jesus is a copy of these other pagan systems. That really wasn't her argument. Um, that was sort of their argument that sort of uh, people tend to associate with her now because a lot of her work was used in Zeitgeist. Um, she would argue not that he was a copy of of other pagan myth themes um but that same thing i think that david fitzgerald would argue or or richard carrier um jesus is a product of his time and that those were products of their time the gods of the mystery religions um so it's a culture in which you see i, I always say people tell people it's like big box stores in our age um you know, Kmart isn't necessarily a copy of Walmart or Target. They're they are a product. They all kind of emerged out of our culture and our age. Um, so it's the same thing. You might have Mithras coming up. Jesus isn't a copy of Mithras, but there are similar things going on in that religion. Or Addis, you know, they had a mystery called Dionysus. Um, so a lot of times the apologists will say, well, this isn't, you know, people didn't castrate themselves for Christianity. So obviously they're not the same thing, but um, the point is, is that they had a mystery cult, which you would go in levels. And even Paul talks about that, you know, different types of Christians, the psychic and the pneumatic. Um, Paul himself talks about going to the third heaven. So the idea of, you know, these things happening in the heavens, you know, we get into the Ascension of Isaiah. These are things to talk about. I'm not saying that it's, we, there's a lot of evidence that has been obscured and obfuscated by the church and uh, over the years. And you, you have to say, well, that doesn't mean that Jesus didn't exist, but it's weird that they did all that. And that it feels like there's something, somebody's trying to hide. And until recently, nobody's really been allowed to do that, to kind of question that. Um, but I think what Richard Carrier has done a good job. And I think Earl Doherty, and I think Dan Murdoch did of uh, showing uh, how Christianity fits in very much like these other religions. It is a product of its time. So it's just like any other trend. Uh, you can, you know, you can do those retro look backs on the nineties or the eighties, everything that there's a product of the time and there's things going on that emerge out of that time. They're not necessarily copies of each other, but it's, it's a trend that reflects the age. And that was one of the Hellenistic trends were mystery cults and there was initiates, and then there was people that were, you know, higher up, and um, and they had a different understanding. You got a different understanding. It's almost like Scientology in a way, where you come in and 
you know, you get through the different levels. And by the time you learn about Zeno, it's ridiculous. But sometimes I feel like that with Christianity, it's like, I, it's not sometimes that you left it. It's just that you might've gotten all the way to the top tier and you realize this is crazy. This is not what I thought it was going to be when I got here. But, um, I was going to say it's, it's not that hard to believe that the first Christians might have thought of, of Jesus as the archangel. It's not at all. Um, and you just think if orthodoxy hadn't changed things over the years, it's simpler to tell people when you, especially when you go in mass, you know, you're taking over an entire empire and whatnot to just be like, this guy died, magic, God blood saved everybody. You got to believe in it. You know, it's easier to simplify the story because as you know, like, even if you get into like Marcionism, the Marcionite Christians or the Valentinian Christians get extremely, extremely sophisticated but complicated theology. So you want to keep it simple if you're going to, you know, take over the Roman empire with it. And that's, that's one of the things Richard Carrier talks about by the time Constantine gets to it. Um, both Christianity had a foothold in both sides of the empire. So it was useful for a uniting the empire. And I mean, that's why we yada, yada, yada years later, here you and I are talking about this. We've been brought up in this, you know, crazy evangelical Christianity because it suited Constantine well in keeping the empire unified after civil wars and, you know, all that stuff. Um, but that's the other thing too. I'm like, it wasn't like it was predestined to be this way. It was politically expedient. And so here we are, you know, yeah. with the, years later. With the whole question of, you know, was Jesus a copy of other gods? I've learned in some ways to clarify the way that's described is, right. you know, it's not a one for one, but at the same point, it's it's been fascinating to me how many things were directly copied that people are willing to discount. Like I remember in um, the uh, Dennis McDonald's work, there's a section where he talks about Hermes and he compares it to Jesus being up on a mountain and coming down, crossing the water and walking on the water to help people. And Hermes is up on a mountain, walks across the water and helps people. And there's endless things, you know, talk about Dionysius with turning water into wine. Uh, right. Zeus would would uh, cry tears of blood and water. Uh, Helios, the sun god, wore a purple robe and had a you know the sun rays around his head, mm -hmm. and so things like that would come up. Like these, there are copies going on within the text that you know so, not everything is a copy, but a lot of it is. And when you right. see it, like you can't unsee it. I think too, just when I again bringing up Enoch, you know Enoch opened my eyes to so many things, but the list of things goes on and on. But people just aren't studying like there's so many pockets of information that change things we're looking at the the cuman community things like right. that so many right. issues that need to be addressed but one of the biggest things that looking at it not as much from the the mythicist perspective and you know kind of like the internal argument that we have as to how did this thing start but just looking at it again from the christian perspective which is you know they're like there are people that come to my channel who don't even probably know what mythicism is mythicism is but they just know that they're not christians anymore but just this idea of saying, let's introduce all this information, bring mm -hmm. it to the table. It doesn't matter how we land. If you think Jesus really existed or you didn't, you know, we can, we can debate it as friends and you can go have a beer afterwards and be, be polite to each other. But at the end of the day, we're agreed on this one big concept, bring as much information that you can to the table that's accurate and let's discuss it in a friendly way but let's bring it and let's share it with other people. And I think right. that's my passion. And, and what breaks my heart is so many Christians grew up having absolutely no idea that there's just more to this story. Like for example, um, hearing that there weren't four gospels, but there were originally probably 60 and there probably, yeah. probably arguably might've been hundreds originally. And we don't know who wrote any of them for the right. most part. And it's like just bits of information like that, that we, when you weave it in, it begins to, to do this thing to your mind where you just say, okay, so I'm not sure why we landed the way we did. We, why did Christianity take this route versus that? Right. And you, it just opens up like pathways of thought in your mind that do create doubt. I mean, they, they definitely create doubts. But the other thing too, is when yeah. you, when you realize this comparative mythology aspect to it, you begin to realize that Jesus, like all these stories that you thought were so wonderful, Jesus walks on water and he heals <laughs> the blind. Um, you're like, they were already doing this stuff like gangbusters in that time, in that era. And it, it 
to me, and this is where the, the, the real, the money shot comes in is like, if you are going to say, you know, this Greek God did it, but it didn't really happen. It's mythology. And this Roman God did it, but mm-hmm. he didn't really do it. It's mythology. All of these stories, like, wait a second, how can you say all of these guys have their amazing, interesting stories, but none of it really happened. And yet Jesus is the one true mythology, kind of like C.S. Lewis would say, they're all, you know, great stories, but not real. But Jesus is the one real one. Well, right. how do you know that? And right. because the more you get into it, you're like, this doesn't smell any different. It smells like it's the same thing. And mm-hmm. I think it it gives you that freedom to say, for the first time, in my opinion, for, for if you grew up in really ultra conservative fundamentalist Christianity to say, wait a second, I believe that someone walked on water. Like, is that is that rational? Is that really does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And to, and the intellectual part of you kicks in and you say, I re- I recognize for the first time in my life, this is an extraordinary claim. And I really do need to have a extraordinary evidence to prove that this actually happened. And when you get when you go down that path enough, you're like, you know what? The evidence isn't very good. And this it also makes you have the weird factor where you're like, this is really weird. Like, I believe a guy walked on water. Is that, does that make sense? Or his, his, um, his mother got pregnant through yeah. a, a spirit. Does that make sense? And the weirdness comes in and kicks in. And, and it, I think it helps people to think, okay, I, if I'm going to believe this, I have to at least admit this is kind of weird and there's not evidence for it. But if you want to still believe it, fine, it's your life. But put it in the right category. It's a fantastical claim with almost no evidence whatsoever that looks like a lot of other fantastical claims already going on for hundreds of years before Christ. You're you're basically right. saying, I want to have permission to believe something that looks like all these other stories and call them false and call mine true. And for a lot of us, once you go down that route and actually like admit it to yourself, be honest with it, that's what you're doing. Right. You, you're like, you'll start laughing at yourself. You're like, wait a second, mm-hmm. this is, this is bullshit. I'm, right. I'm the I'm the bullshitter right. now. You know, I'm believing it. You know, everyone else used to be. You know, the Muslims were the crazy people. The 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 Job's witnesses were false. They were a cult. This group was a cult. They were idiots. And all of a sudden, you're like, actually, I'm the one. I'm the <laughs> I'm one with the, the weird idiot. beliefs. Yeah, I'm the one with the weird beliefs. And <laughs> I'm the idiot. I know. Yeah. I've yeah, I've done it. Um, I even I think there's even people that are um probably even now atheists, uh, they you know, call themselves athe- atheists and they've left that religion. They've left the practice of it. I think there's residual things. There, there were things in me um, that were, re- were residual. And I think that uh, the whole idea of Jesus not existing, it, it, it's a reflexive pearl clutching, you know, like, how can you say that? There had to be a guy. Um, but I, I think that's been proven that there doesn't have to have been a guy. Um, there were a number of people, like I said, I think that the Gospels might have modeled uh, when they created, you know, when Mark wrote about uh, Jesus. Uh, I'm sure there was plenty of uh, post 70 examples uh, to draw from. No problem with that. So sometimes I think people might be saying there is a guy and I'm saying there isn't a guy and we might be talking about maybe some of the same references in the Gospels. But um, yeah, it's it's you, I think that's the thing is to break down your mythology, your personal mythology that you've been indoctrinated with and realize it's just, I've just been indoctrinated with it. That's the only reason I believe it. It's as ridiculous as everything else. So um, I think that's something the internet's done because when I came along, I graduated college in 95. I mean, barely there was any internet then we were using like the Dewey Decimal System and card catalogs and you would go through. So to get this information, you had to work so much harder. Um, And I think once the internet came along and now we can do podcasts and and things like that, I think that's helped to, you know, get people out there. And it's, it's part of what's breaking down the church though, because now people are exposed to this information and realizing, well, you know, there's a lot of mystery cults out there that, um, you know, there were similar you know, so you got David Fitzgerald breaking this stuff down. He started, I think he wrote Nailed in like 2010. So I know they get frustrated and they get a lot of heat from people constantly. So I think they appreciate it when people come along and they say, you know, thank you. You've changed the way I see things. Um, so I hope people mm-hmm. will do that. Send uh, David Fitzgerald, uh, Richard Carrier. Um, I, and there's even more, uh, like I said, there's Michael Lawrence. Uh, he wrote 70 uh, Paul George wrote on Christian origins. He's rewritten some, both of them rewrote a couple of books into a, a revised edition. 
Um, another one I forgot to mention was David Oliver Smith. Uh, he just wrote The Bible Tells Me So, a critical analysis of the Jesus myth, which is, I think, fantastic. Um, maybe one day I might be able to talk Richard Carrier into reviewing it. I doubt it. He's so busy. But he uses a lot of, of Carrier's work in Price's work, but he uses Eisenman. Um, it's, it's a well... I like to just read things and say this part I really loved. I don't know if I buy that part, that argument. Um, so it doesn't mean you have to buy the whole, the entire thesis. Um, but sometimes, like I said, you find that part of somebody else's thesis that you don't particularly buy the whole thing. Uh, Butcher's, you know, a, a thesis that you do subscribe to, or you think it's got pretty good, you know, mm. up, you know, pretty good reason to, to, uh, for you to take seriously yeah. so anyway I, yeah i'm glad i got to get his book in there because i really like that a lot with with just the whole journey of, of escaping <laughs> mythology as a worldview mm -hmm. did you feel like there was a certain point at which you were looking back at yourself at all and saying how did i ever believe this like for example two of the big ones to me that keep hitting are uh circumcision and the the lord's table the eucharist the idea of saying, I've got a God who wants to mutilate a little boy's genitals as opposed to just making him the way he wants them. Right. And, you know, I'm going to symbolically, or if you're in the, maybe if, if you're into the transubstantiation in the Roman Catholic Church, you know, believe in the actual transformation of the, of the elements. But if you're a good Protestant, it's all symbol, you know, but you're symbolically eating a dead man's flesh and symbolically drinking a dead man's blood. Did it ever creep you out? Like to think, like, you know how if, if you were to watch some movie where there's some tribal cult, like in the middle of the jungle somewhere, and you look at their stuff and you think, that's so freaking weird. Like that, whatever yeah. they do, it's so weird. And, and you know, that for them, it's normal because it's, but, but you, you just could never in a million years imagine yourself ever being like that mm -hmm. because it's so different. And then. Yeah, they're so barbaric. It, so <laughs> barbaric. Like, like, does it ever take your breath yeah. away a little bit to think, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, like that's that's not as different of a world as it seems. I actually was in that kind of thing. It just got polished up in different ways. Right. No, it's true. Um, you want to examine everyone else's beliefs, but your own. Um, but it's true. It's like, you, that's, you know, we, I remember, of course, in the, in the Protestant, we're not quite as strict about it. The, you know, everything becoming everything. It's just a symbol, but the Catholics believe it. And then the Catholics believed it first. And, you know, they try to act like, uh, you know, the Catholics are less than or something like they're not as Christian as, you know, you as a Protestant, and you're like, oh, we wouldn't be here without the Catholics. So, uh, you know, they were sort of a variation on the, you know, the Catholics, they came first. So we can't really say that. Um, and that's the truth. It's, you know, it's believed to turn into the blood and the body of Christ, but that doesn't really work in kind of a, the modern age, right? So you have to realize that these are sensibilities from you know the medieval times basically uh so that's the thing are these uh, the whole thought process the uh actual um values are they appropriate for today because we're not living in the you know medieval times and we're not we're not trying to hold the roman empire together we're not living in uh you know that's why a lot of the creeds were created so the creeds were to uh, to keep, you know, kind of bring everybody into the fold. And so that's, that's not necessarily because they were the most logical thing. It was just trying to get everybody on the same page and trying to keep, you know, like I said, keep the empire together, but you ended up getting, there's a lot of variations of Christianity. You had the Aryan Christians, you know, uh, Nestorians, you had all kinds of people and they had to just kind of be rolled into Orthodox Christianity to keep everybody like together um, politically, but that's that's the whole thing. You get back to it, and you find this is this is all political. So it's not that there's even um, it's not that it's not logical for sure. It's not logical in terms of you know what you've been taught to believe. It served a political purpose at one time and a different time in which the values were different. So um, you have to start thinking about that too. So the craziness of what you believe, but also that it's a value system that reflects a different time period. And is not necessarily relevant to the time period that you're living in. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. is it like, you know, do you, 
believing that it's, you know, the, the biscuit and the, <laughs> and the wine are getting turned into real blood. And, you know, in a day where you've got DNA and <laughs> it's like but the it, meme, you know? Yeah. But, but I mean, even if it's a symbol, it's still really weird. It's like, we're, yeah. it's like, yes, you're not a zombie. I'm right. um, sorry. You're, right, right. you're not a cannibal, but you're pretending to be a cannibal. It doesn't right. make it much different. Like if you're, right. if you're okay, pretending to be accountable i'm sorry you're it's still really weird mm -hmm. but it is with, weird it is, it is weird mm -hmm. with all this stuff you know that that went through your mind both the social stuff and the mythology stuff there's still a personal impact that that comes as you start to deconstruct and deconvert mm -hmm. like at what point yeah. did you actually say wow i'm i'm out like was it a was yeah. it a day a week was it a just did you just reflect and say wow at some point in the last six months i must have left but i'm mm -hmm. definitely out now how did the last few weeks and months and days work? And what was it like to, to you know, like what were the implications in mm -hmm. terms of the emotions of thinking, maybe I don't go anywhere when I die? Like, how did it all pan out for you emotionally? Yeah, that was probably, like I said, around 2013-ish. Um, it was before I ran into Sean and Fritz. Uh, so I want to say around 40, at the time I was like 40, 41, uh, something like that. I look at Facebook and I'm like, I see things I was posting and I'm still using like a little bit of Christianese <laughs> on things. So I'm thinking it's um, about 2013-ish uh, around that time. I started, um, when I started looking at the DM Murdoch's work, um, like I said, I'd, I'd been primed by it. I think I was becoming more of a person who could accept an Bart Ehrman view of Jesus. Like he's probably a guy and he was mythologized. And um, that was still part of my journey, you know, deconverting. But um, for some reason, and I don't even understand why, but when I read, um, I read her work and then I went on to read um, Earl Doherty's The Jesus Puzzle. I read The Christ Conspiracy and then I read a you know, few other things of hers. Um, and then I, the next thing I read was Earl Doherty's The Jesus Puzzle. I remember putting that down by the time, because I never take just one person. I can never read just one scholar and be like, oh, that's it. But when you have a few different arguments that are converging on something, um, the I, that flipping of Jesus from a guy to a celestial being. And I realized, I think this makes too much sense crap <laughs> because it's like i have to decide am i gonna follow the truth or am i just gonna kind of go along with it and um and that because the truth of it if that's the truth which i feel like that's along the lines the right path of best argument um that's a long road to walk because even atheists freak out if you say well i don't know if there was a person jesus a guy jesus they're um, you know, you try to explain the whole thing to them. But I remember when I got done with the Jesus puzzle, just being kind of, I felt like I stared at the wall for three days. I always say that kind of broke me just really getting to the understanding that Paul, Paul really may have just had a hallucinatory encounter with a revelatory being. And that is all that Christianity is based on. And all of these years of war and inquisition and and you know uh a death you know all of it witch burning all of this stuff even just people being oppressed through christianity and the stuff that i went through all of it you know just your mental health and all the things that it does um all of that because the guy had a hallucination <laughs> part of you kind of minimizes it but you're just like everything's based off of this probably um and I think that, I mean, there's more to it, of course. The Jewish wars, I do feel like, had uh, a catalyst effect. It might not have, uh, without the Jewish wars, I don't know what would have happened to Pauline Christianity. Who knows? Um, but I think that's something that um, David Oliver Smith did a really good job of, like, kind of talking about in his book. So he kind of brings all of that together. Uh, so um, I just, it's just funny, though. You can have a guy who maybe, you know, about 2,000 years ago had hallucinations and here we are <laughs> so could be all that it's based on it could just be his personal revelatory interpretation of scripture reading between the lines pressure you know um and 
just having visions of Jesus and that this is where we all are here. It doesn't have any logical, but you know, that's the thing is we don't always understand that being we're, we're raised, you know, uh, to be in this age, you're, everything's about science and critical thought. And to the first Christians, these things weren't necessarily, you know, relevant. So, yeah, uh, you know, but that, yeah, it's hard to think that though all, um, everything that so much of our culture is based on that. You know, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah, it's amazing too. Two thoughts on that. That number one, there was a lot of other groups having leaders right. with revelations, even even right. even to this you know current date um, with um, Joseph Smith. You know, people claiming revelations, right. and yet so many of us would write them all off and say, "No, nah, that's all garbage." Um, it's like, yeah, but but what if yours started the exact same way? I know hallucinations <laughs> can happen multiple ways. Um, such as they could have been aesthetics and people fasting for, you know, such a long period that their brain kind of does things. But with all of the uh, evidence that you do come across for there being substances that they were using in the temples and so forth, you know, the ecstatic experiences of Dionysius, for example, they were definitely putting some stuff in their wine. Mm -hmm. And it makes you wonder like, wow, this whole thing could have even started from literally drugs and mm -hmm. And yet here we are thousands of years later and still still believe in it because of one guy got high. And yes. it's like, it blows your mind. It really does. Yes. And it, it really sh shakes you up to think like th one of the biggest things for me at the end of my de uh, deconstruction process, right at the, like the very day of my deconversion, the very first question I had is I was like, I was talking to myself through this process all in an hour. I'm talking about like one specific conversation in my head in an hour. And I was saying, you know what? I don't think this, I don't think this whole thing's real. Like, I don't think Jesus is real. Not in the sense of mythicism, just like he's not actually like a God. I don't think right. Yahweh is real. And as soon as I said it, the first thought I had was there's no way that the whole human race could have been deceived for 2000 years. There's just no way. And I, I just kind of sat on that thought for a minute. And I was like, actually, yeah, we could have been deceived, self-deceived for 2000 years like why not we would have said the buddhists are all deceived we would have said all the muslims are all deceived why couldn't the rest of us have been deceived too like why is it just one one group that alone is free of self deception it doesn't make any sense and mm -hmm. i was like that it makes perfect sense that we could have all done this especially when you add in the idea that for many generations it wasn't even self deception it was just like believe this or die you know <laughs> yeah like, that's like, um something michael Lawrence talks about um we we're sort of almost bred we've been almost bred into being uh accepting this uh, creed because if you didn't you got killed and you probably didn't reproduce so it was in your best interest to and that might even be part of it like you might have been sort of bred into us to be the best christian because your survival and your offspring survival it gets kind of evolutionary but it depends on it because if you were too much of a heretic i mean of course orthodoxy kind of retroactively called a lot of the, um, you know, the different sex heretics to get rid of them, even though some of them were the earliest Christian groups. But even throughout the ages, um, you know, you think, well, there's a Spanish Inquisition and whatnot. But um, yeah, so if you were, if you weren't going with the flow and, you know, staying in the corral there, you were going to get uh, some way, shape or form, you were going to get uh, pressed for it, or you weren't going to get a positive feedback for it. And some people like were just killed and they didn't get to reproduce because, you know, they weren't going with it, going with the program. So he does, he talks about that a little bit in his book, but we've almost been like sheep selectively bred to be um, the best Christians, you know, in the, in Western culture. Yeah. And that's scary to think about. kind of weird. Yeah. You, I always think about that. I mean, how many other, uh, you know, Galileos, how many brilliant minds were, you know, that we places you, you sort of think of uh, in the multiverse, other places where brilliant people were probably killed because they were too smart to to go with this theology and, and accept it as history and reality. So it's like that. You know. I forget who the quote exactly, but that idea of you know, if it hadn't been for Christianity taking over the world, who knows where we could have been by now? We could have been exactly. already you know up in the stars and on the moon, living there by now, but. Um, right. Just going back to the your personal experience, did it hurt you to think you might not go anywhere when you die? No. Um, you know what? I think you're young, but when you get older, you sort of just think um you get you get closer. I'm turning 51 this year. So you sort of 
realize well, it's not going to be around forever. I'm not going to be here forever. You don't think about it as much to your kids. Maybe get older, you get a little more time to yourself because you're so busy. I had my kids like when I was 30 and 33, that you're so busy um, just trying to raise them and just survive. And the only thing you're afraid of is dying before they get old enough to take care of themselves. <laughs> Um, I think that's the biggest thing when you have kids, you're like, I'm afraid of dying, but not because I'm afraid of dying. I'm afraid of them, you know, not having a parent to take care of them or having as many parents to take care of them. Um, so that is the thing that worries you. I think when you're, when you've got kids, now my kids are getting older and I'm 51 and I'm like, I'm pretty at peace with things. I want to live long enough to, you know, let them see them off in the world. And I'm good with going back to the grass and the trees being back part of the earth, you know, it, it doesn't bother me. I've always been a little bit like that. I'm like, mm, you know, one day I'm, I, I remember thinking that in college, I mean, it's strange because you're, you're still in that kind of eternal mindset. Like you're going to go, you know, go be with Jesus, but you know, your body's going back to the earth and um, you know, that's, that's fine with me. I, I told them, like, you can cremate me and dump me somewhere. That's fine. <laughs> I don't need like a stone. <laughs> if you could, like if someone said to you, um, I can offer you the chance to just basically be annihilated, to just turn into nothing, or I can offer you the chance to go to heaven someday, and it is actually a wonderful place, and you won't get bored, yada, yada. Would you want to live forever if you could? No, no. I think when you get to be a little bit older, you'll be like tired of living forever. <laughs> I wouldn't. You, you, it's, I don't know if it's just about you hit a threshold. When you hit about 15, you're like, no, I don't want to. I mean, I enjoy, I think when you get older, you find joy in a lot of things. I, I love going outside and, and my, you know, digging in the flowers and the earth. And, um, I do I just get outside and get dirt on your fingernails and just dig and plant flowers and smell the earth. I grew up on a farm too. So you just sort of uh, like to go out and take your shoes off and feel the grass a little bit once in a while. You forget about the things that you liked when you were a child, but, um, I, I don't, it gets tired. I'd be too tired to live for it's too much. So mm. I'm like, good. I mean, I hope I live, you know, you want to live a good long life. Make sure your kids are good. Hopefully you get to see grandchildren go, you know, know that everybody's well, and then you can leave and you have to leave because other people have to have their time. The children have to come up and they have to make their world. And you know, there's, you know, they always have like the millennial boomer thing struggle going on right now, but it's because, you know, the millennials are, they're coming up and you're, you're making your world. This is your time. And there's some people that don't want to give it, give that up, but you know, you have to, you have to, I was reading the, I've read the book, the fourth turning, uh, which is a really interesting uh, book about uh, social turnover. Every, um, it just came out in 97. I, I can't believe I just found it not too long ago. Um, but that's a really interesting book to read if you're talking about like social and it's very strange because it's almost like this book was written in 1997 and I'm, I'm reading it now, which is about the time of what they call the fourth turning every uh, 80 years. There's like a turning every 20 years. And like, it was almost on cue that the Ukraine uh, Russia war broke out. I'm like, that's just weird. But, they, but there's, I guess humans sort of follow certain patterns in, um, uh, in, in the world. And um you have to let your children grow up and take over. You can't hog the spotlight forever either. And they have their own ideas and they create a new society in their, you know, what they need, what's relevant for them. Yeah. So no, I would not want to live forever. It would probably drive me crazy because there's only two ways to be. You have to live in their world that they've created, or you have to be, there's people I think that are frustrated because the world, you know, you hear it. In my day, we didn't blah, 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 da, da, da. Well, it's not your day anymore. And I say things like that to my kids and they're like, well, it's not your time anymore. It's our time. So back well, off. I'll just so, add, I, I, I'm I, definitely the, I play the, the other side of that. I definitely still struggle with it. Um, I, I've had this argument a couple of times actually with Jonathan M.S. Pierce and the whole, you know, the boredom fact, like you don't, you can't grasp how long eternity is. You would get bored eventually. Right. And yeah, um, there's a part of me that I, I get the I, the argument, but mm -hmm. I definitely can't, I still cannot go there. Like I wanted to, and still do want to live forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And if I say that, you know, somewhat jokingly, like it just as devil's advocate for that question, but also 
to say that this was a very emotional process. It broke my heart. Like I could not, it was like that, that phrase, like, are you kidding me? Like, this is all fake. Like none of this has ever been real. I've never like for, for just for the immediacy of like, I've never been praying to God. I've always been talking to the the wall and the ceiling. <laughs> so you're, are you kidding me? Yeah. But then like, are you kidding me? I've been looking forward to like, this is not my real life. My real yeah. life starts when I die. I'm like, right. are you kidding me? Like this, this is my real life. And I, nothing starts later. Like this is it. <laughs> this is as good as it gets. <laughs> That's like, that, I was like, that, that means that all yeah. this, like, you know, but like when you're, warming up for the the big soccer game or the big race or something you're stretching and everything and you're like but you you're waiting for the ref to blow the whistle and the real game starts and and then you realize like wait a second like there is no real game and you know the the eternity game there's no real game that's going to start like the warm-up is the game and that's it it's over and it it broke my heart it truly crushed me and it still does to this day i still struggle a lot emotionally with losing eternity, but I, I recognize that I don't think it, um, I don't think it's there. I don't think there's anything. Well, Can I ask? Was, with, yeah. Mm -hmm. with, with that concept though, and, and I know I got to wrap up shortly, but that brings up the question of what is, I don't know how to phrase it exactly, but what is the meaning of life or how do you create meaning? I guess there's no real meaning like imposed on us, but how do you create it? Uh, would you call yourself a nihilist or how do you, how do you figure out, how mm -hmm. to make life meaning uh, for your life, knowing that ultimately, um, you know, you're not going anywhere when you die. Um, well, getting briefly back, I, I think too, getting slight going back to Constantine too, um, real quickly, I would say when you have feudalism, because he pretty much instituted feudalism, um, it's much easier to control people into being subservient when this isn't the best. When you die, that's when you get rewarded. So uh, it upheld that system too, that whole, you know, reward after you die. This isn't even the great life. But when you throw that worldview off and you realize this is the, this is your life, you know, this is the, as good as it gets, how good or bad you make it, you're responsible for your choices. Um, and there's things I always feel like I wish I'd learned sooner, but um it's not God. I mean, there, there's some things you fall into and I'm like, oh, that was lucky. That was a good stroke of luck for me, or that was a bad turn of events. But you sort of learn that, okay, I don't always have control over what happens to me, but I have control over how I react to it. And in the realm of realizing that this is your life, this is the your life to make of it what you will. Um, this is life, the one you got. Uh, so, you know, make the most of what today is. So I think when you get a little bit older too, I, I, I remember that. I remember being like in my early twenties when my grandfather died and realizing uh, I'm, I'm going to be dead one day too. And that was like, when I remember that just hitting me one day. And, um, but in your twenties, you can't deal with it very well. You don't, you're not, you're not, it's not time for you to think about that. You're out to go out, start your life uh, and have your family or whatever you're going to do with your life. And that's what you're supposed to be thinking about then. Well, now I'm 51 and it's been like, I'm almost done raising my children and you're kind of looking at your sunset years and you're like, well, that's all good. I'm, I'm enjoying, I want to just, but you get, um, it's not that you just want to enjoy life. You get joy out of simple things. Um, like you'll see me on Facebook. I post a lot of time we go walk on the beach in the evening. I love to watch the sunset um, over the bay. Uh, we are, we we're right by the Chesapeake Bay. Like that is heaven. I still, I, I step out of my car and we just, because we're, we're actually only like a half mile. We can walk down there, but I, you take a little more, um, you take that in a little more. There's little beautiful moments that you get to have because you know, it doesn't last forever. Your life doesn't last forever, but you get to be here in this moment on somehow ended up on this planet you know, right here now in this beautiful moment. Um, and I think that makes you appreciate the life that you're living more. And that's the thing I think giving up all of this has taught me is to one, hopefully be a little bit of a better person in my actions, be a more socially conscious person to think about other people more um, and do it for the sake of just being a good human being. And I'm only going to be here for so long. And that's part of what 
this stuff, the pages I have is to help people like you, other people um, to just find information when they're ready to look for it, um, to deconvert and to rethink their worldview a little bit too. But um, anyway, getting back to that, I, I think you take, um, I, I think that's something I've learned to take a lot. Look at the moment, just enjoy the moments and take them in a little bit more because you don't have an eternity, you know, it's, it always feels like sometimes I feel like eternity is in this moment, this beautiful moment. It's right here. So that's yeah. how I look at it. Or at least that you want to freeze those beautiful moments yes. as much as you can. Yes. But I just feel like it's just, this is heaven right here. You know, you get out and you, you just have a beautiful scene in front of you or something peaceful, something that just brings that happiness over you. And that's heaven. You know, you be glad you even get to, to experience it. So mm, I love it. Well, in, in terms of wrapping up, I did want to ask um, just for anyone that is going through a similar journey where they're maybe starting to investigate um, the claims of Christianity, whether that takes them towards mythicism or not, or even if they even right. care to investigate that, but just investigating the actual claims of, of Christianity as a worldview. And they're starting to say there's cracks, big cracks, um, and they're kind of scared maybe both of what the implications are for them, but also knowing that they may be cut off from loved ones who may shun them or at least look down on them for a decision to not hold the, um, the, the, the party line for Christianity. There's a lot at stake that can be lost and there's a lot right. of pain that can happen. And it's just, it's just a lot of fear of like, all of a sudden you're like, I, I've, I've always thought of myself as I am a son or a daughter of the King. My relationship, to, you know, my identity is found in that higher, higher reality. And right. you realize like, if that's not true, then I don't know who I am. So the just the trauma of saying I, I've never, yeah. never really been myself before. Who am I? Right, um, right. Reclaiming yourself. That's that's a whole big process, yes. and it's very painful, and it's very lonely at times. If you were, if someone were listening, they're, where they're kind of like in the the darker, harder parts of that. Do you have any ad advice or final words you'd say to them as they think through it all? Um, I was fortunate that my spouse is he's always thought it was kind of a crock of stuff. Um, so I think if you, you know, if you are married to somebody who's still invested in the religion, it is going to be harder. But um, I think there's a lot of communities, you're building a community of, of people that are deconstructing. Um, a lot of online communities, which is nice too. But um, like Derek Lambert, he's built Myth Vision. Um, I think that's, you know, good because there's a lot of people that are in the middle of deconverting from different uh, religious worldviews there. He himself did that too. Um, and I hope I've, I hope I've helped him with that to help him grow that channel. Uh, so as yeah, as mythicist Milwaukee was kind of winding down with the, with that stuff, I kind of jumped over and was, uh, hopefully supporting Derek as his channel grew too. And, um, I, I think that's a good thing to do. Get an online community that are, are dealing with some of the same topics, um, that you can just, talk to because you can you know uh jump on there and just ask a question same with your your page you can just you know here i'm going through this today so um i think building facebook pages twitter pages um and a, a sense of community because that's the thing about church is it is a community so if you're leaving one community you want to be able to that we're social beings we need to even if it's online um you can get support from a different community so find another Fortunately, now there's a lot more um, communities out there that are looking into, um, you know, how the Bible was put together, why it was put together, and if they could even find out who wrote some of these things. And uh, of course, they're finding out a lot of the stuff isn't as as late as it used to be, or you know, like we thought, as we're believed or we we're taught to believe. Um, so they're fortunately now on the internet, you can find a lot of other people that are in the process of deconverting who have questions. And uh, even like Reddit communities too. There's so I would say find a community that'll support you because it's going to be hard if you're just going it alone. Um, and fortunately, I keep saying fortunately, but it's, it's it's we're in a time where you can live online and make some friends online and um, get support online too. So and you may find out some of these people will live closer to you and you might be able to meet up with them too. Who knows? So. Um, I think I, I think that's good. I think that's the main thing is find a community that supports you in your journey. Now, just like you did when you were a Christian, you know, you found a, a, a community that supported you in your journey and you can find a community to support you in your journey out of it. 
Um, and that's, we're living in a good time for that, which didn't necessarily exist as much before the internet. So that's, that's good. That's a good thing. So, I love it. Good, good thoughts. I would yeah. just say too the, um, the idea of being willing to just really search for the truth. I think, Correct. I think you'd agree with me in saying it's even as bizarre as this journey can be. And sometimes the truth does seem stranger than fiction. Yes. Um, it's 100%. like, it's, it's still worth it to, 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 to be like, I'd rather know the truth and not be deceived than be willfully ignorant. Um, I know some people right. might want to be plugged back in the matrix and just not know. Right. But I think for most of us, it's like you know, that, that joy of thinking, I did not just take the life that was given to me and, and dictated to me with all of its parameters. I chose my own path at some point, you know, and maybe not early, but at some point I took responsibility for my own life, my own worldview, my own perspective. And I pursued the truth where it, wherever it took me. And there's a, there's a joy in that, to be honest, in well my said. opinion of just, it just, I remember even saying this early on to loved ones in my family, when I was first deconstructing, I was, I would not have said yet, I'm going to become an atheist, but I said something like, just so y'all know, I am really investigating a lot of things and I want to know the truth. And I said, if, if my current worldview, meaning Christianity, if my current worldview lines up with the truth, then I have no problems. They're the same. But if my if my pursuit of the truth takes me to a spot where it diverges from my current worldview, I'm going to go where my where the truth takes me. And I remember yes. the Christians, my Christian loved ones, being absolutely horrified at my saying that. Like, what the hell are you talking about? Of course, mm -hmm. it's going to lead you to Christianity because Christianity is true. But my being able to say, yeah, but if it if it proves not to be true, right. I'll pursue the truth. And to be willing to take that adventure. And um, I don't I know other people, you know, it's it's a very painful journey for some, but I felt like I won the lottery. I felt like I could have easily seen the chips fall in a way that I could have been a Christian my whole life and never known. There was this whole whole huge amount of, I mean, vaults worth of information that completely got deprived of my attention and, and information. And to realize so many of my friends are gonna go to their graves never knowing that this whole thing was mythology and spending their whole lives talking to themselves, but thinking they're talking to a higher power to realize you've never lived. You, you will go to the day you die, never living a day of your life being yourself for real. Right. And, authentic. And yes. Authentic. And that, the privilege of that, of, of escaping to me is just, I'd rather have the truth myself. That's, I couldn't have said it better. That's exactly how I feel about it. Um, that's why like, actually, yeah, if you, you can follow hashtag Jesus Smith on Facebook. Um, I have a lot of stuff catalog, particularly Richard Carrier, David Fitzgerald, um, Raphael Latasser stuff. And I, mm. you can follow Richard Carrier, hashtag Richard Carrier. Um, I've built enough. If you post enough, if you create enough content, you can follow the hashtags. Uh, and David Fitzgerald too. I'm working on, uh, there's a lot of David Fitzgerald. So if you follow that hashtag, you might, <laughs> might run to other David Fitzgeralds, but um, it's the same thing. I'm trying to make it easier for people to to come across the information that they, the ones that are looking for it. So it's sort of like a rabbit hole. Um, and you know, you're you one day it, it happens, it happened to you, it happened to me. You just see the white rabbit and you're like, what's that? And you, you know, you want to chase it down the rabbit hole and it's it goes, it goes for miles and miles, and you just keep finding out. And it's been almost a decade later, and I'm still, you know, learning new things and discovering new things. This is it's 2000 years of of like history that's been just sort of varnished over and you're just peeling back so much stuff and even you know we're having that conversation with Richard Carrier it's like there's just stuff that we can't know because the evidence has been destroyed and it's extremely frustrating but then again you have go back and you're like why why is why is why are things destroyed? Why have the you know medieval Christians destroyed a lot of things? It's very bottlenecked right there, um, and you're just like there's so many so much historical evidence that should have been preserved about this completely non famous guy who was the most famous guy. <laughs> you know, it's like it's when you hear apologists, it's like well he was nobody. Jesus was nobody. But you're like, well, how did he get to be? So, you know, notorious, everything happened after he died. I'm like, well, that's great, but where is he? <laughs> Somebody has to be able to locate him in history. And there's, of course, there's a lot of people that say, well, he was this guy and he was that guy. And I'm like, but there's so many guys. <laughs> Every historicist has a different Jesus. So um, it's just, 
I, like you said, even if he existed, um, I, I don't, I think, I feel like Robert, Robert Price is, he's been lost to history. So how can we, we're not following the teachings of Jesus. We're following the teachings of uh, early Christians for yeah. some reason or other found him useful. Um, but not the person himself. We just can't know him if he did exist in the first place. So, um, from an These academic are, perspective, yeah. too, that's, it's very pers- frustrating. But from a Christian, like a religious perspective, yeah. that that fact of what you just said also needs to shake people up to say, if if God really wants you to believe something, he will give you really good evidence and really good reasons. He won't make it look like this book is purely human. He'll make it right. look like it's divine because it is. He'll make it miraculous and he'll he'll make it in a way that he's not the author of confusion. So it won't be confusing. It will be crystal clear. And um the fact that he is kind of lost to history kind of shows, in my opinion, that, you know, this, this doesn't smell divine anymore. Yeah. This book, if this book were divine, it'd be very, very different. Um, and yes. arguably he wouldn't even have written a book. He would have just way, <laughs> done, done it very differently. Right. But or maybe like, Jesus would have written something, you know? Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. Like, and and in Jesus. Aramaic, not Greek. <laughs> yeah. Just, <laughs> in his own yeah. language. Uh, yeah everything would make sense historically i think you know it's just it is it's very it's, yeah very hellenistic like he was very hellenistic you know <laughs> yeah but little, uh little very too, great too, too hellenistic yeah um i know yes. we've gone over so much was there any final thoughts you had about anything mm-hmm. we've talked about that you wanted to add before we wrap up oh uh, no i just hope uh really the reason i do this stuff is just to uh, make this information more accessible to people that like you who are um me too, who are, are sort of on a journey to kind of discover the truth and investigate uh, beyond what the uh, official church narrative has been. And I know they're out there, but um, there's, yeah, and I've actually just posted a Richard Carrier quote on, even on Awaken Our Mythology, and it still just gets people going. Uh, they, the whole idea that Paul came first and maybe possibly hallucinated a celestial figure uh, before the gospels and the gospels were, you know, created after this, this character was created after Paul, it is really hard for people to wrap their brains around. And I, what I was saying in the group chat the other day, that's really what broke me was putting down the Jesus puzzle and understanding that, um, Paul came first. He didn't know who the heck the guy in the gospels was that just, blew my mind uh it just when i finally just got that through my head he didn't know jesus and people are like well yeah he didn't know him he wrote after him and he kind of knew things from the people that knew him and it was like no there's no evidence that he knew you know he says he gets everything his revelation from jesus from no man but there's no evidence of him you know the people that you know every those people are usually um it's like david oliver smith right like he created the Mark, the author of Mark created his narrative based off of Paul's letters, generally speaking. So people that Paul meets on the way sort of get worked into the disciples, the fictional disciples. So it dawns on you one day, Paul just didn't know any of these people, didn't know about them because you've been exposed through, um, I call it, I call it the Wizard of Oz effect. Um, I was uh, talking in the uh, group chat the other day too about the, the, in the original Wizard of Oz book, uh, Dorothy went to the Emerald City, but the Emerald City wasn't actually the Emerald City. Before you could go into the city, the gatekeeper put, he locked a pair of green goggles onto your eyes. So I feel like that's how it is when you're brought up in Christianity. That's how Western culture is. Your, Your gospel glasses are locked onto your eyes and you read Paul through the gospels. Um, and so somebody like Earl Doherty comes along and they just sort of rip them off your face and you're just, you know, the Emerald city is not green. It's just a regular city. Um, so it was, it was it, to me, I always felt like that was a, a similar analysis. Um, we've had that. We've been walking around with gospel glasses. We've been reading Paul through the gospels for, you know, 1800 years or so. Um, so that's something we need to give up uh, doing. And that's really hard. It just sort of blows everyone's mind when they, they sort of, it's, just, it's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard on your brain. Yeah. So we were talking about something that really was hard uh, when I when I first get it, got into this stuff. And that was that understanding that Paul just was a guy who was reading between the lines of scripture, um, kind of coming up with his own Christ 
based off of scripture and personal revelation, never met Jesus in the gospels. Acts is fiction. You know, these are fictional, everybody getting along stuff. He didn't get along with the Jerusalem brothers, you know, so probably um, they had kind of a different interpretation of, of Christ, more of a Jewish type thing and less Gentile friendly uh, situation. Of course, he became more popular because he was able to bring more people, more money, more Gentiles, you know, and when you don't have to get circumcised, you know, <laughs> it's a selling point, you know, all of that stuff. But um, yeah, that's just, uh, that's something I want people to, that's the, the big point I want people to start understanding is that it's uh, very, very possible that about, you know, so much of this is just based on what Paul came up with and he didn't necessarily meet Jesus or was influenced by his teaching or you know, any of that stuff. So hmm. that's my, I guess that's what I do. <laughs> so. Yeah. And the, either way, no matter how we fall on some of those details, like Jesus, right as we know him through the Bible is, is mythology. That Christianity right. is mythology. hundred percent. hundred percent. Whether yeah. it was a guy or not, it's mythology, but yeah. well, this is really cool. I, I definitely look forward to working through some of the many articles and, and things that you post for anyone else that wants to kind of follow along with that. Um, I'll have the links beneath our video. So please go like, and subscribe to Christian's Facebook pages. Um, I'll have the links to the books we've been talking about. So, so go to support those authors through Amazon. Please. And yes. Absolutely. And Kristen, I just want to say thank you so much. You, you've, um, between our private discussions and public <laughs> stuff, you've been an absolutely amazing help to me and an encouragement on so many levels and just a lot of straight up information and insight. So thank you for what you're doing. Please keep it up. Please don't stop. We need your voice in this. Thank you. I need to hear that. <laughs> you get a lot of negative feedback in this, in this type of, uh, you know, doing this stuff on, uh, on social media because it, you post a few things and it, it drives Christians crazy, <laughs> which is good. Yeah. And <laughs> even some atheists, feedback, but... even drives some atheists crazy. Yes. Which is really yeah. weird to think about, but yeah, it does. Yeah. Well, you're doing great stuff. So keep it up. We appreciate it. And I look forward to all the good things to, to come. Thank you so much for sharing your story today. It's been great to get to hear it. And um, let's do it again sometime. Let's do it. No problem. I'll be happy to come back. Awesome. Thanks, Kristen. Take care.